Well, let's go ahead and have our Bible study. If you have a Bible with you, go ahead and get your Bible out. Turn your Bible on. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. And uh, if you haven't filled out that Connect card yet, there's still time to go ahead and fill that out. Let us know how we can pray for you. You can hand this to anyone at the doors on the way out, or there's some receptacles right there. Just drop it in, and we'd be glad to pray with you this week. And uh, go ahead and get out that listening guide that you received. We're going to fill in some blanks here in just a moment. This will help you follow along, and it'll give you some information that you can maybe use this week during your own family Bible study or maybe at the dinner table as you have conversations with your family. And, and let me just say this on the front end. Um, if you have not put the leadership rally on your calendar yet, please go ahead and do that. I really need you to be there. I want you to be there. Even if you don't consider yourself a leader, uh, by the power invested in me in uh, Indian Rocks, you're a leader. So I need you there, and uh, I need you to come. It's two weeks from today at 3 o'clock. It'll be from 3 to 5. And uh, we've got some really important information that we want to share with you uh, regarding the future of our church and some opportunities that God has put in front of us. And so I need you to be at that. Also, last week, um, we were talking about God's foundation for people. And we were talking about how much every life matters to God. And we issued a challenge to our church family. We said, hey, if, if we're going to be a pro-life church then we've got to put our money where our mouth is and we've got to do something about it. And, and I asked if any of you would be willing to put your name on a list saying, hey, I, I would sign up to help a family who's in the middle of a crisis pregnancy. In fact, we'd be so willing to do that that uh, we, we would open our home, open our hearts for adoption. And uh, I was just so encouraged. We had about 20 families sign up to adopt children out of a crisis pregnancy situation. And so I just, I just love being a part of a church that's on the move. I love being a part of a church that is willing to actually do the hard thing and go where God is leading, and it's, it's just such a blessing. We're talking about foundations, and foundations matter. And it matters what you believe. And so we started off talking about what we believe about creation, and we said that matters. We said it matters what you believe about people. It matters what you believe about men and women and babies and senior adults. It matters what you believe about yourself. And today we're going to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to talk about sin. And sin is something that affects all of us. We all feel it. We understand the brokenness that comes from it. The doctrine of sin is called homardiology. It's a big seminary word, homardiology. And it just simply means we all sin. We all sin. It matters what you believe about sin and your own sinful condition, my own sinful condition. Sin is not just something you do. It's who we are. It's baked on the inside of who we are. It's this idea that we're messed up and we feel it, and we know it. In fact, you know it so well that some of you are feeling it right now. And so let's just do this. Let's go ahead and get it out there in the open. Can you go ahead and look at the person next to you and just say, I'm messed up? <laughs> yeah, it's true. You are, and so am I. We're messed up. And if you can't even utter those words, it just goes to show you how messed up you really are. <laughs> We're messed up. We've been talking about creation. We've been talking about humanity. Today we're going to talk about why things seem so broken, why we're so messed up, why it seems like our foundation is flawed. And as we're going to see, our world is broken, our world is flawed, but we're not forgotten. And God understands this about, his, about our sinful condition, and he understands it so much so that he did something about it. Now, let me do a quick little review, and then we'll jump into Genesis 3. So in Genesis chapter 1, God made the world. He made light. He made water. He made plants and stars and galaxies. He made trees and animals. And in the crowning moment of all of God's creation, he made humanity, you and me. And he made us in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And so we are created to represent God. We are God's representatives to the rest of creation. When creation wants to know what God looks like, they look at you because you were made in the image of God. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And we see this in Genesis chapter 1. Then in Genesis chapter 2, God places Adam in paradise, in the Garden of Eden, and he gives him one command, just this one command. In fact, we'll put it on the screen for you. This is Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. It says this, 
the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So you've got Adam in the garden. Massive amount of freedom, all kinds of flexibility, lots of autonomy. He can eat from any tree except for one, one tree. And then God gives Adam a job. He says, Adam, I want you to name all the animals. So Adam gets to work, and all these animals come marching by, and whatever Adam named it, that's what its name would be. And so these animals come marching by, and he says, lizard, dog, duckbill platypus, zebra, capybara, and he starts naming all these animals. And as he's naming them, he gets sad because he doesn't see any of these animals looking anything like him. And he recognizes this is such a big job. God, I need help. None of these animals is like me. I feel all alone. And besides all that, this is a big job. I need help. So God looks down. He sees Adam all alone. And after each day of creation, God calls it good. After day one, God says it was good. After day two, God says it was good. After day three, God says it was good. And every day of creation, God declares it to be good. But then, for the first time ever, God looks down. He sees Adam all alone. And for the first time ever, he says, this is not good. This is not good. It is not good for man to be alone. It's not. I mean, seriously. Have you ever been to a boy's dorm room at a college. I mean, it is not good for man to be alone. When men are alone, bad things happen. So God performed the first surgery. He used the first anesthetic. He put Adam to sleep. And God said, I'm not just going to make someone like you. I'm going to make someone from you. And he put Adam to sleep, and he created someone who would complete Adam. And when Adam awoke, there standing before him in the Garden of Eden in perfect paradise was the most beautiful woman in the world, the only woman in the world. <laughs> and now he truly had everything he ever needed. He's there in paradise. He has an abundance of food. He has this wonderful home. He has this beautiful woman. They're both buck naked, and they're standing there in paradise. He has everything that he needs. Adam can hardly contain himself. He's beside himself. He starts spouting off poetry, just trying to impress this woman. This is, this is the first pickup line in all the Bible. Boys, fellas, you should take note of this. He says this, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called, whoa, man. <laughs> because she was taken out of man. Then God performed the first marriage. He brings this man and woman together, and he gives this cultural mandate. He says, I want you to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and take dominion. In other words, I want you to dominate the earth. I want you to take dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. I want you to take dominion over the entire planet. And everything was perfect. Everything was good until it wasn't. And that's where we pick up in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. This command not to eat of the tree was given to Adam long before Eve was even created. Satan saw Eve as a, 
a more vulnerable person. Evidently, Adam didn't do a very good job communicating the rules of the garden to Eve. There was a communication breakdown between the husband and the wife. I'm so glad that doesn't happen today. Adam was passive. He should have stepped forward. He should have protected his wife. He should have done something about this, but instead of stepping forward, he steps back. That's why all throughout the Bible, this sin is not called the sin of Eve. It's called the sin of Adam. Even though Eve was the first to grab the fruit, the first to eat the fruit, it's not called the sin of Eve. It's called the sin of Adam. Adam was passive in his headship, passive in his leadership. God created man to be the head of the household, and instead of stepping forward, Adam stepped back. And truly, their eyes were opened. And what they saw was absolutely terrifying. They saw some things that they'd never seen before. They saw shame. They saw fear. They'd never experienced fear before. They saw guilt. They saw regret, separation. They saw pain and judgment. They saw loss. They're, they're about to see the curse of God on all humanity. They're about to see strife and toil. They're about to be they're about to be expelled from paradise. They saw pain and childbearing, and ultimately they saw death, all because their eyes were opened. Yes, their eyes were open. They saw something more than they ever wanted to see. One commentator said it would be like one who is deaf receiving their hearing only to hear the loud screams of people for the rest of their lives. Verse 8, and they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among, among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me. She gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. One theologian, he said, Sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. It will cost you more than you want to pay. Years later, the psalmist would write this, where can I hide from your presence, Lord? If I ascend to the heavens, you are there. If I descend to the depths, you are there. See, God knew exactly where Adam was. This was not a question of proximity. When he asks, where are you? This was a question about his relationship with Adam. Adam, where are you? Where are you spiritually? Where is our friendship? Where is our relationship? Where is the trust? Where are you? I think God asks the same question of us sometimes. Aaron, where are you? He knows exactly where Adam is. This is not a question of proximity. Sin made Adam fear the voice of God. I heard your voice and I was scared. Then Adam was busted. He starts blaming people. First, he blames God. Oh God, it's this woman that you gave to me. Remember, you gave me this woman. And he turned this great gift, this great blessing into a curse. And then he starts blaming Eve. It's her fault. It's her. She did this. And then she starts blaming the devil. It's his fault. He tempted. This is like the guy who walks around asking, who stole my sunglasses? Who stole my sunglasses? Was it you? Was it you? Was it you? And all the while they're sitting on his head. You ever met that guy? And all the while God's looking down at his creation, at Adam and Eve, and his heart is just broken. So God issues a curse, first on the serpent. Look at verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman. You may want to underline this verse. We're going to come back to it. I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your 
Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. You ever wonder why that happens? It's all part of the curse. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. This is the word of the Lord. If there were no Genesis chapter 3, we would have no need for the rest of the Bible. Genesis chapter 3 shows us the depths of our own brokenness, our own fallen condition. Genesis 4 and following show us the abounding consequences of Adam's sin and the abounding grace of our Heavenly Father. God doesn't leave Adam and Eve with a fractured foundation. He goes after them from the very beginning. He seeks them out, looking for them in the garden, asking, where are you, Adam? And then even in their sin, he goes and looks for them. Even in their shame, he covers them, performing the first animal sacrifice. He takes skin of an animal, covering over their sin, covering over their nakedness. And even in their brokenness, God promises ultimate redemption, a rescuer who's going to come from the offspring of Eve. One day, there's going to be a head-crushing, heel-bruising rescuer who's going to come and redeem and roll back the curse of sin and death. So what can we learn from Genesis chapter 3? If you have your listening guide, go ahead and get it out. Let's fill in a couple of blanks here. There's some things we can learn about our own sinful condition. Number one is this. Sin is any departure from God's design. Any departure from God's design. Now, we talk about this every single week, that God has a design for every area of life. He has a design for men and women and boys and girls. He has a design for churches and government and schools. God has a design. But when we leave God's design, the Bible calls that sin. And anytime we leave God's design, we are sinning, and it always leaves us in brokenness. Now, we see God's design in God's Word. That's how we find it. God's design is not found in pop culture. God's design is not found in intuition or feelings. You're going to be tempted to think, oh, God's design is found in the way that I feel. If it makes me feel good, that's got to be from God. But that's not how God works. God's design is found in his word. So sometimes you're going to feel something that feels so right, but God's word says it's so wrong. And later on, you will realize that. You'll realize the consequences of brokenness. That's why we don't trust our feelings. We trust God's word. Sin happens when we willfully or ignorantly don't follow God's word. When you look at the story of Adam and Eve, this is what happened. They didn't follow God's word. God said, eat the tree, eat of the tree, you will die. And instead, they, they ignored God's word. Satan comes along and he says, oh, you won't surely die. Oh, come on. You don't believe that, do you? And they didn't follow God's design. Satan will always attack God by attacking God's word. He's going to attack God's will in your life. If he can get you out of God's word, he'll get you to doubt God's word, and half the battle's already won. This is why you need God's word in your life. If you're not in a Bible study, you've got to get into God's word. You've got to study it and know it so that you know when these things are intuitively against God's design. You've got to feast on God's word. You can't depend on a once a week sermon that's 30 minutes or 40 or 50, depending on who's preaching. You can't depend on that to be your only sustenance of God's word. You've got to feast on the word of God like you feast on a sumptuous meal. 
Like you're at Bascom's eating that wonderful ribeye steak or the billionaire's bacon. You gotta feast on God's word. It is so important. If you don't know God's word, you're not gonna know God's will. You gotta get into a Bible study. We're launching a lot of new Bible studies this time of the year. If you're not in one, you should get into one. This is a great time of the year, a great opportunity for you to get to know God's word in a deeper way. So when you're faced with a question from the devil, you'll know exactly how to respond. When the devil comes to you and he says, did God really say you should forgive that person? I mean, after all that they've done to you, after all the heartache that they've caused, did God really say you should forgive them? Yeah, he did, because it's in his word. It's so easy for me to answer that question. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Did God really say it's better for you to live apart before moving in together? I mean, don't you think you should try before you buy? I mean, didn't, does God really say that? Is that really what he means? Yeah, it really is. Because God's will is found in God's word. Yeah, but did God really say that I should be generous? Did God really say I should forgive? Did God really say these things? Yeah, he did. And Satan's gonna constantly come to you and say, come on, did God really say that? Because that's what Satan does. He's been doing that since the very beginning. And he'll do that in your life as well. That's why you've got to know God's word. Anytime we depart from God's design, the Bible calls that sin. The Bible teaches that we're all sinners. Now, just because you're a sinner, it doesn't mean that you're as bad as you can be. It just means that you don't measure up to God's standard. None of us do. In fact, this is so easy to understand because we don't even measure up to our own standards, do we? I mean, don't we disappoint ourselves all the time? I know I do. I, I wish I was the better version of myself, but I'm not. I fail myself all the time. And the Bible says that we fail God all the time. The Bible talks about two different kinds of sinning. There's sins of commission and sins of omission. Sins of commission are the ones that you willfully commit. You do it. You know that you shouldn't have done it, but you've done it. But then there's these sins of omission, these things that we should have done that we didn't do. God calls you to share your faith, and you don't do it. God wanted me to be generous, and I didn't do it. God wants me to serve the needs of others, and I don't do it. These are sins of omission. Now, let me share with you some things that I've learned about sin over the years, and I've learned some of these by experience. Let me tell you some things that I've learned. Sometimes sin is not your fault. Sometimes sin is not your fault. When our children were younger, uh, our two older boys, when they were probably like two and three years old, we, we lived in this house in West Palm Beach that we'd rented. And um, uh, one day I came home, and there was Bisquick powder all over the place. I mean, everywhere. And I looked at my two boys and I said, who did it? And they kind of did like this, you know, to each other. And I had done everything right to prepare for this situation. I'm trying to be a good dad. I'm providing groceries for my family. I put it on a shelf that was pretty high up. I didn't think little kids could get to it. I mean, I thought I'd done everything other than like tell little boys that they're not supposed to play in Bisquick. And there I am in the kitchen and it looks like they had snow angels of Bisquick right there in the kitchen. I mean, it was just everywhere. And here's what I learned in that scenario. This sin is not my fault, but it is my responsibility. Sin is not always your fault, but it is your responsibility. Some of you are managing sin that is not your fault. Things that happened to you at a very young age, things that have been passed down to you from generation to generation, and you have this inherited sin, you have this guilt, you have this stuff in your family that keeps brewing and it keeps coming up. And listen to me, it's not all your fault, but it is your responsibility. And you have a responsibility to deal with the sin that is in your life. You're gonna to have to figure out how to manage that sin that's in your life. It is your responsibility. Here's something else that I've learned. Sometimes sin splatters. Sometimes sin splatters. You think it only impacts you. You think it's not gonna hurt anyone else, but it does. As we all know, sin splatters. It gets on everyone and everything around it. That divorce, it splatters on other people. That explosion of anger, it splatters on everyone around. That decision to steal, it splatters on others. Sin splatters. And every time we depart from God's design, the Bible calls that sin. Number two, sin starts in my heart. Sin starts in my heart. The Bible calls this very first inkling temptation. Now, temptation is not a sin. It's not, in fact. The Bible says Jesus was tempted many times. But what you do with that temptation can quickly lead to sin. Here's what temptation is. Temptation 
is an opportunity to accomplish a good thing in a bad way. It's an opportunity to accomplish a good thing in a bad way. You want to pass a test, that's a good thing. You do it by cheating, that's a bad thing. You want to pay a bill, that's a good thing. You do it by stealing money, that's a bad thing. So temptation happens all the time in your life. This is why Jesus said, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. When we lived in West Palm Beach, we lived near what I would consider to be the world's worst Walmart. There's a lot of good Walmarts, but this one was by far the worst. I mean, I've been to a lot of Walmarts, and I typically love Walmart. This one was the worst. I'm sure they're not all like this, but this one, it was awful. Every time I went there, broken shopping carts, mean employees, trash in the parking lot. They would always overcharge me. I mean, this place was terrible. It, it was so bad, and everyone knew it. In fact, one time, my friend Kevin... He had one of those propane tanks hooked up to his grill and he had to get his propane tank refilled. So he took it to Walmart. He gets out of the car, he gets his propane tank. He walks in the store with his propane tank and they all start yelling at him saying, you can't come in here with that. You can't come in here with that. And he says, I don't even want to be in here. This is the worst Walmart in the world. And he goes back outside. Everybody hated this Walmart. It was the worst. My wife knew that every time I went to this Walmart, I would come home cranky. They took too long. They messed up our order, they were rude, they overcharged. Every time, it was an awful experience. When I think about Jesus saying, lead me not into temptation, I think about that Walmart. Because <laughs> when I go to that Walmart, I'm tempted to be cranky, I'm tempted to be angry. When Jesus says, lead me not into temptation, he was talking about Walmart. That's why, that's why I changed something. And from that point forward, I started going to Publix. You know why? Sure, it costs me more. Sure, they don't have all the same products that Walmart has. But I come home happier. You know why? Because at Publix, shopping is a pleasure. <laughs> I love that store. Lead me not into temptation. Danny Aiken is a theologian. He says the most important battles you'll ever face in life are going to be won or lost in your mind in your mind. This is why the greatest commandment from Jesus is to love the Lord your God with all your mind, all your heart. If you do this, everything else will fall in line. It starts in my heart, but it doesn't stay there. It manifests itself in words and actions and deeds. Sin leads me to say things that I never wanted to say, never should have said. It leads me to do things that I never should have done. It leads me to do things that I really, really regret. So when you're tempted, what do you do about it? Do you keep on returning over and over and over again? Do you keep returning to that same Walmart parking lot over and over and over again? Proverbs says, like a dog who returns to his vomit is a fool who returns to his folly. If you know that's an area of temptation for you, go to Publix. Do something else. Have a different habit. habit. Quit opening that app. How about deleting that app? Getting rid of that phone. Get a flip phone if that's your source of temptation. Figure out a new pattern in your life. If you know this is a temptation in your life, do something about it. Crucify it. Don't let it keep crucifying you. Number three, sin leads me to brokenness, shame, and separation. Sin leads me to brokenness, shame, and separation. Adam and Eve's perfect relationship with God was now broken. Where are you, Adam? Where are you? I not know exactly where you are physically, but where are you? Where are you in this relationship? Where are you spiritually? What happened to us, Adam? Adam was full of shame. He hid. He covered himself. He didn't even want to be around God. Sin causes this kind of separation, doesn't it? It makes you want to stay out of church and not even be around other believers. It makes you want to avoid Christians. Where are you? Sin splatters. Sin separates. This is a total tool of the devil. Sin brings shame into your life. Number four, God responds to my sin. God's response to my sin is the gospel. God's response to my sin is the gospel. Genesis 3.15 I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This verse is called the Proto-Evangelium. It means it's the first mention of the gospel. 
You can search through the entire Bible. This is the very first time this prophecy, this mention of the gospel is listed in the Bible. And the prophecy is this, that one day there's going to be a rescuer who comes through you, Eve, through your offspring. One day a rescuer is going to come who's going to roll back the curse of sin and death. He's going to make everything right again, just the way it was in the garden before you sinned. And when he comes, he's going to bruise his heel. That's the crucifixion. There's going to be a cost to pay. But he will crush your head, Satan. That's the resurrection. Jesus came to be crushed on the cross so that he could crush the head of the serpent. He takes sin seriously. So seriously that God sent his one and only son to be crucified on a cross for your sin and mine and to be raised from the dead, crushing the head of the devil forever. And one day he's going to throw the devil into the lake of fire. That's the promise from God. This is why Paul calls Jesus the true and better Adam. Adam made this major mistake in the garden, this sin of passivity. Adam sinned after one temptation in the garden. Jesus never sinned after multiple temptations in the wilderness. Three times the devil came specifically to tempt Jesus and he resisted the devil. Adam stepped back, allowing his wife to sin, so Jesus had to step forward, going to the cross, taking on our sin, taking on our shame. Adam should have chased away that dumb-talking snake. And since he didn't, Jesus had to come and crush his head. And that's what he did at the cross. God takes sin seriously. Jesus used extreme language to talk about how we should think about our own sin and our response to it. In fact, Jesus said, if if your hand is causing, causing you to sin, you should chop it off. If your eye is causing you to sin, you should gouge it out. You should take serious, extreme measure toward your sin. When I was in college, there were a few guys who had their old, original Nintendo Entertainment Systems. You guys remember the original Nintendo? I got a picture of one. We'll put that up on the screen. You guys remember that right there? Okay, all you teenagers, you gamers today, you don't, you don't know anything about this right here. This is the OG original gaming system, okay? You don't know anything about up, down, left, right, select, start, BA. I'm telling you, you just don't even know. Okay, this is the original gaming console. And when I was in college, there were a few guys that had some of these systems, and we would hook them up, and we'd play video games, and we'd play games like Zelda and Tetris. I think somebody might have even had Mortal Kombat. I mean, we used to play all these great games. And my friend Nathan, he got hooked on a game called Dr. Mario. And Dr. Mario was a Tetris-type game that you play against yourself. And it was really about getting the best score, and so you could never win. It was just like this circular game that you could never finish because you're competing against yourself. And my friend Nathan, he got hooked on it. So much so that he played every day for an entire week. He started missing classes. He started missing work. He even started missing church. Now, Nathan was a Christian, and one day I went over to his apartment, and I saw the Dr. Mario video game cartridge sitting on the counter. You guys remember those cartridges, the ones you had to blow in? You remember that? That's how you had to get it to work. I saw the Dr. Mario cartridge with a knife in the middle of it sitting on his counter. And I said, Nathan, what happened to Dr. Mario? He said, I got serious about my sin. He noticed that this game was a distraction and it was causing him to sin. Some of you, you got to get serious about your sin. You keep walking right back into it. You need to delete that app. You need to get a flip phone. You need to end that relationship. You need to let God take control. Some of you are flirting with things that are leading you into temptation. And Jesus says, lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from evil. In the early 2000s, I worked at a Christian college, and I helped lead all of the men's ministry for this Christian college. And uh, back then, we didn't have Wi-Fi. This was before the Wi-Fi days, and in the dorm rooms, everybody had an Ethernet port. And to access the Internet, you had to plug in a cord from the Ethernet port into your laptop, and so everybody had these cords, and they were these long cords that would help you get on the internet. And if you had a research project, if you were writing a paper, you would get that cord out and you would plug it in. And I'll, I'll never forget in college, or when I was working for this college, I had several young men that would come to my office. And they would have their ethernet cord wrapped and bound, and they would give it to me. And they'd say, Pastor, can you lock this up? 
this cord is causing me to sin. Now, most of their sin was downloading illegal songs on Napster. You guys don't even know what that is, but that's what they were doing. Some of them had some other sins, things that they were accessing because they had that ethernet cord. And I so appreciate men. I so appreciate when men take their sin seriously and they do something about it. And these young men, they took these cords and they asked me to lock them up in my office so that they would not be tempted to sin. Some of you need to do a version of that in your own life. Whatever it is that is tempting you, whatever it is that's pulling you away from God's design, you've gotta take serious, serious action. Number five, God receives me when I repent and believe. God receives me when I repent and believe. I grew up in a religious tradition where when I went to church, one of the things that we had to do was we had to sit with a priest and confess our sins to the priest. And in the church that I was a part of, it was a startup church. And so we didn't have one of those fancy confessional booths. I had to sit in a chair as a little boy, eye to eye with the priest. And he would look at me and I would look at him and I would have to say something like this, uh, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. Um, I think I told like 30 lies since the last time I saw you. I stole a pack of gum. I think I hit my brother on the head with my lunchbox. And I remember confessing all these sins to him. And then he would say back to me, okay, knock it off and go say some prayers. And he'd give me a list of prayers to say and I'd go back to my seat and I'd say the prayers. And then the next day I'd feel great for about five minutes until I started lying again and beating up on my little brother. Like it just happened all over again. And that's why there's a big difference between confession and repentance. Confession is when you admit to God, I'm a sinner. These are the ways that I'm sinning. I'm agreeing with you, God, about what you already see in me. That's confession. But repentance is a change of heart that leads to a change of action. Repentance is a military term. It means I'm moving in this direction and I'm so convicted that I'm gonna turn around and I'm gonna do something about it. I'm gonna get rid of the ethernet cord. I'm gonna stab that video game. I'm gonna get rid of this phone. I'm gonna get rid of this app. I'm repenting. I'm actively doing some things to turn away from the sin. God wants us to repent. God receives me when I repent. And when I believe in the gospel, he's calling us to repent. There's a big difference between confession and repentance. Confession is the starting point. But where the rubber hits the road is really repentance. God is calling all of us as Christians to be professional repenters. We've got to get really, really good at repenting because it's gonna keep coming up over and over and over again. When you first became a Christian, repentance was easy, wasn't it? Because your heart was tender to the things of God. You already told him, God, my yes is on the table. I'll go anywhere, I'll do anything, I'll say anything, I'll give anything, my life is yours, I'll do anything. I've been crucified with Christ, I'm now yours. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. It was really easy back then. But if you're not careful, your heart gets calloused and your heart gets hard. And all of a sudden you start not caring about sin as much as you used to. You need to pray, God, convict me. God, I need you to reveal to me the areas of sin in my own heart that I can't even see. God, I need you to bring other believers into my life to point it out. You know, a blind spot is no longer a blind spot when it's revealed. You need to ask God to reveal the sin that's in your own heart, in my own heart. Sometimes we get so comfortable that we forget how bad the sin really is. Our sin stinks to God. We get so comfortable with it. There was a small college that had a football team and they, they wanted to get a mascot, so they got a goat. And then the question was, well, what are we gonna do with the goat? Like, who's gonna keep the goat, take care of the goat, feed the goat, who's gonna, who's gonna, who's gonna house the goat? And these two boys, these college boys, they stepped forward and they said, oh, the goat can come and live with us in our dorm room. Coach found out about this and he said, hey, I, I hear you're gonna be keeping the goat in your dorm room. What about the smell? And the boys responded, oh, the goat will get used to the smell. <laughs> Some of us have gotten used to our smell so much so that you don't smell it anymore. You gotta ask God, reveal it to me. Reveal it to me. Show me where I'm not walking with you. And then number six, repentance begins in my heart. Repentance begins in my heart. The same way that sin begins in your heart, that's where repentance begins, in your heart. If there's one animal that I can't stand, 
I know you thought I was going to say cat. <laughs> it's actually a snake. I hate snakes. The serpent is a symbol for sin. It's a symbol for brokenness. But the first step of healing is to admit that you actually are broken. In Numbers chapter 21, God's people are on the move, and they're encamped in the wilderness, and these venomous snakes, they ransack the encampment. And anytime someone got bit by these venomous snakes, their skin would begin to puff up, and they'd have all these wounds all over them, and eventually they would, they would die. It was this devastating plague on God's people. You can read all about it in Numbers chapter 21. And so God gave Moses this cure. He said, I want you to take this bronze snake, this serpent, and I want you to put it on a pole in the middle of the camp. Put it up really, really high where anyone can look and see this serpent. Bronze was this metal that symbolized judgment. And so God said, anyone who looks at the snake and believes in God will be healed. And so all over the camp, people were given a choice. You can look and live, or you can ignore and die. Sometimes God is calling us to look at our sin square in the face and recognize it for what it is. A anyone know what a catechist is? You guys know this symbol? Sure you do. Th throw that symbol up on the screen here. You've seen this. Every time you go to a medical facility, anytime you go to a clinic, you see this symbol. It's a symbol that, that refers to healing. We know this symbol. Jesus referenced the story of Numbers 21 in John chapter 3 when he's having a conversation with Nicodemus. He said, just as Moses lifted up that serpent on a pole, just as he lifted up that bronze serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that anyone who looks to Jesus can look and live. Why do you have to look at Jesus on the cross? Because it's on the cross that he's bearing all my sin and all my shame. Because on the cross, God took all the sins of all the believers of all the world, and he dumped them on Jesus. So when you look at Jesus on the cross, it's as if you're looking at a serpent on a pole. It's as if you're looking at the most vile, most wicked thing you've ever seen in your life. Because God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. So when you look at Jesus, you have a choice. You can look and live, or you can ignore and die. One of the problems with our sinful condition is that our immediate temptation is to ignore and die. And the Bible's calling us to look and live. One of the greatest ways that we look and live, one of the greatest ways we remind ourselves of the sacrifice that Christ made for us is by receiving the Lord's Supper. And we're gonna do that together right now. If you're helping to serve the Lord's Supper, why don't you go ahead and head to the back and grab those elements. The Lord's Supper is an opportunity for us to remember the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, the second coming of Christ. It's an opportunity for us to look and live. The Bible says that the Lord's Supper is for believers in Christ. It's for those who have been scripturally baptized, who identify with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Maybe you're here today and you're not yet a believer in Christ. You haven't been scripturally baptized. We'd encourage you to refrain today. Let today be your day of salvation. Trust in the Lord. Look and live. If you're visiting with us today and you'd normally take the Lord's Supper at your home church, we welcome you to take it as our guest today. Today's our opportunity to look to Jesus. But today I want to encourage you to do something a little bit different. Normally, while these elements are being passed out, we sing along with our worship team who's leading us in worship. But today, I actually wanna encourage you just to take a moment of silence to confess your sins to the Lord. Take a moment and ask God to reveal to you any sins that you need to repent of. After you confess it to the Lord, why don't you make a commitment that today, today I'm gonna to turn away from it. Because of what Christ has done for me, because of the crucifixion and the resurrection, I'm not just gonna confess it, I'm gonna repent of it. I'm gonna turn away from it. And I'm going to live for Christ. So I'm going to pray. And then our, uh, our ushers are going to hand out these elements.
Won't you hold it and we'll all eat and drink together. And while you're holding on to it, take some time, confess your sins to the Lord, we'll all eat and drink together. Father in heaven, thank you for the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. God, we're so grateful that he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God. God, we're grateful for Jesus who was lifted up. Help us to look and live. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.